thank you uh, sheila ma'am for this introduction and uh, good evening everybody i hope i am audible and clear to everyone yes okay thank you uh, at the outset um, i really appreciate uh, the ipsa executive members and the convener of this uh, series of uh, science and our life lectures um, for having invited me and given me this opportunity to deliver this talk uh, so going by the spirit of science uh, and our life uh, this lecture series um i think uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that biological sciences has had a, a tremendous effect on human lives medicine health agricultural sciences like crops fruits etc and uh, i feel and i find dna to be one of the most important molecules uh, that has been studied for a very long time and i have been dabbling and uh, studying uh, recombinant using recombinant dna technology to study protein protein interactions so i find this as one of the most attractive molecule so before i actually plunge into my talk let me just share with you the flow of my talk so um what i'll do is i will uh, sail you through the discovery of dna um and then i'll culminate the discovery uh, by showing you the structure of dna as well as the genes how they are arranged on the dna uh, strand followed by the uh, various molecules and processes that hover around dna particularly that have been uh, isolated and discovered from the cells this has brought us closer to the uh, most important technology in biology we call it as the recombinant dna technology in which i'll highlight four such important tools that have impacted medical science and agricultural science and uh, in these impacts on medical and agricultural science i'll share with you uh, some of my uh, you know thoughts on gene therapy as well as transgenic so let me start this one let me start with the discovery um, just give me a minute i'm trying to minimize this uh, yes i'm not able to minimize but that's okay um Ma so you can escape press the escape to uh, want to minimize the no so i i'm getting that band of your zoom thing right so i was just trying to see if i could actually but that's fine no problem full screen yeah no problem so uh, if we all remember there was one uh, uh, pastor whose name was gregor mendel sometimes in the mid of the 19th uh, century he uh, brought us close to what is known as a genetic trait or the genetic element that is passed down from generation to generation using the humble pea plant however there was there was not much that was known as so what is this element that is passed from generations to generations it was only when frederick meister who was essentially a medical physiological chemist and uh, he was the one who uh, he he used to uh, tend towards the wounds of patients in the bargain he used to collect a lot of bandages and uh, these bandages were rich in pus cells his interest was in neutrophils nevertheless he tried to understand how these cells um, are given out of these wounds and uh, when he took uh, a collection of these pus cells he went through a few stages and uh, those stages uh, essentially uh, let me just use a laser so these were the pus cells he went through a few stages of alcohol wa wash to remove the membrane and then a uh, you know pepsin wash which essentially takes care of all your proteins it degrades your proteins brings down to some particulate matter when this particulate matter was treated with a alkali followed by an acid wash he landed up with a white precipitate in his test tube later on this was called as dna but he called it as a nuclein and he said that this is not only acidic but it is also phosphate rich then there was a gap of almost 60 years to the discovery of the real genetic element called dna there was a, a gentleman by the name frederick griffith who was trying to understand how pneumonia is caused by the causative agent uh, streptococcus pneumoniae and uh, in in doing so while he was studying patients he was trying to grow these pneumococcus 
and he was using a particular medium as shown in these various plates down here. He was trying to grow these uh, various types of pneumococcus pathogen. He arrived at two such pathogens based on the colony characteristics, based on the colony features. So each dot that you see on this plate is a colony. He found out that some cells were rough. That means they didn't have a smoothness to them, while the other cells were smooth. Now, he devised a very elegant yet simple experiment. And what he did was he took the rough cells. So the, the ones which did not have a sheen, he called them as rough cells. He injected those rough cells into a mice. And he found that the throat swab of the mice replicated the live or uh, replicated the rough cells, but the mice did not die. On the other hand, when he took the live S cells or the smooth cells and injected them in a mice, the mouse unfortunately died. The same mice, uh, the same uh, mouse had uh, colonies of the smooth type. However, when he heat killed the smooth cells and injected those heat killed cells into the mice, there were no colonies in the throat swab of this mouse nor did the mouse die. In the fourth column, what he did was he took the live uh, rough cells and he mixed them with the smooth cells which were heat killed. Now, as expected from the other columns, he thought that he would get the rough cells back because he had heat killed the smooth cells. So the smooth cells should not be there. To his surprise, the mice died, the mouse died, as well as the, there were two types of colonies growing, both the rough and the smooth. So he thought that there is something that is going from the rough cells to the heat killed smooth cells. Sorry, there is something going from the heat killed smooth cells to the rough cells, making this particular uh, mixture pathogenic and thereby killing the mice. He called them as the transforming principle because he felt the heat killed cells were transforming something to the live uh, to the to the uh, rough cells and making them pathogenic. Further on, and I'm not going to really go into the details of this discovery, um, there were these three scientists who essentially followed up with Griffith's experiment and they divided the filtrate of the heat-killed cells into three portions. One they treated with the protease, which is going to degrade our protein. One, another portion they uh, treated with an RNA degrading uh, enzyme, that is the ribonuclease. And the third portion, they, de they used uh, DNAs or deoxyribonuclease, which is going to degrade the DNA. These three portions were mixed with the rough cells, the live rough cells. In doing so, they expected, they got what they expected, what Griffith uh, arrived at, that is there was transformation, the mice lived. In this case, where the proteins were degraded, there was transformation, the mice lived, and so was it with the RNA-treated cells where the mice lived. And there was one particular case when they treated with DNA, that means when they degraded the DNA, there was no transformation and the mice lived. And therefore, they arrived at the fact that in this case, since the mice lived, DNA must be the clip. I, I'm sorry, they should be mice lived and not died. So they, they inferred that in this case, it is the DNA which is the culprit and DNA is the pathogenic agent that is getting transferred from the heat killed cells to the rough cells also going to show that DNA can sustain the heat that uh, were, you know, that were exuded from the heat kill cell. In a subsequent experiment using phages, Hershey and Chase essentially showed that this DNA was not only acidic in nature, but also had a lot of phosphate content to it. And then we came to the seminal discovery of Watson and Crick who proposed the structure for of DNA. After observing the X-ray diffraction images that were taken by Rosalind Franklin. So essentially what she did is she again isolated DNA in a very pure form by modifying Frederick Meister's uh, isolation procedure. And this pure form of DNA gave her this kind of diffraction pattern. Ultimately, we uh, arrived at not only a few Nobel Prizes from this discovery, but we also showed that DNA stores uh, and transmits genetic information and that it is a double-stranded helix. This double-stranded helix basically has, as I said, a phosphate-rich moiety, a phosphate moiety bonded to a sugar moiety, and both these are in turn bonded to either one of the nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. The way these are arranged on each strand, they, 
they literally for look like a sequence uh, um, you know something that is stacked over each other and there is some characteristic sequence to it the phosphate sugar phosphate being the backbone on both these strands wherein according to what we call a shagav's rule one purine will pair with another py pyrimidine giving an equidistant between both these uh, both these uh, backbones and therefore by the rule an adenine will always pair with thymine a cytosine will always pair with guanine thereby giving this kind of splendid structure of the double helix of dna now when these X-ray images were finalized and more work was done, more biophysical work was done, people realized that this thread or this polymer of nucleotides, so each is a nucleotide, each of these will form a polymer bonded by the phosphodiester bond. People found out that this, these fibers or this thread-like material was very long. And they, to their surprise, E. coli, for example, which is the most uh, simplest uh, prokaryotic bacteria called as Escherichia coli, which is also a, a part of the normal flora in a human gut. Uh, when it was sequenced, people found out that it has to the tune of 4.6 million base pairs. So you can imagine writing 4.6 million base pairs on this entire slide. It won't have the capacity to do so. Imagine the capacity of E. coli cell cramming 4.6 million base pair in a very tiny cell, which is barely one to one, one and a half micrometers long. So it has to literally cram it. The other, on the other hand, if we consider our human DNA, the entire chromosome length, if we keep them back to back to each other, all the 46 chromosome, it will roughly be one between one to two meters long. And human cells are anywhere between 15 to, you know, 40, 50 micrometers and that too in the nucleus of the cell. So this was a very challenging uh, fact in biology that, uh, you know, um, that led us to the discovery of what we know as super coiling of DNA. So the entire thread, the entire polymer, the nucleotide polymer called DNA now has to fold on itself. So this is your DNA, the double stranded DNA. This thread is known to be bound onto five histone uh, proteins connected to each other by a linker. This linker also is DNA. So it's, it's essentially like the beads on a string, the way we wear necklaces, like those pearls, you know, on a, on a, on a, uh, on a, on a necklace. Now, when these get together, they form what is known as the chromatin fiber. That means they further condense. And these chromatin fibers then form these characteristic scaffolds, which then form the chromosomes that we normally see, uh, that we normally get to see if we stain chromosomes in using any, any cell, not just human, but any cell. On the other hand, there is another characteristic type of supercoiling super in E. coli cell, all the bacterial cell. It is not as complicated as we see in human cell. It is, uh, it is slightly simpler but it has to fold, it has to condense, it has to compress, and therefore it has to supercoil. In E. coli DNA, you actually see a, a, a tiny scaffold in the center made up of proteins and the DNA loops around this scaffold. In turn, the, the each loop also twists and turns to give a supercoiling nature. And this is how DNA, this is how DNA sits in our cell, which is a very, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, this is a very complicated scenario. If the DNA has to function inside the cell, it has to unfold itself. It has to uncompress. It has to unclump itself. This is a very clumping kind of a status for DNA. So if it has to function, it has to carry out any kind of activity. It has to open up in, in this particular form. And this is a very daunting task for the cell. Therefore, the cell uses several enzymes, several proteins, throughout the activity of the cell, right from our birth, I mean, right from the time, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a fertilization happening till, till we die. This is all the time happening. There are several proteins that carry out these processes. And that therefore takes me to the structure, to the actual structure that is present on this seek, on this particular double-stranded DNA. So with time, people realize that uh, the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic DNA can essentially be compared with each other, particularly with certain common denominators. What is that common denominator? The common denominator is essentially put over here. Whenever we look at a gene structure, whenever we look at a series of nucleotides, 
series of nucleotides on on a double stranded dna it's very difficult to recognize what is what we do not know whether there is a particular gene sitting over there or there is something that is regulating it so to make it simple biologists molecular biologists to be precise they looked at these sequences very closely and they divided these sequences into two parts one part known as a regulatory region which never expresses it only controls what is downstream of it and this is the downstream portion that i'm showing you here and the downstream portion essentially has what we call as a coding portion that will make our rna and that will make our protein so according to the biology dogma we must know that dna makes rna and rna makes protein and this is a universal phenomena right from bacteria to humans each and every cell in our body which has dna will make rna and that rna will give proteins and proteins are the uh, work horses of our cell they are the laborers of our cell they will carry out all the function the dna never moves out of the nucleus or in its nucleoid it is always sitting over there it is carrying out its function sitting in the nucleus and giving out information it is giving out instruction via the rna to the protein and for that for these kind of instruction it needs some command it needs a regulator it needs a commanding uh, uh, sequence and that is known as a regulatory gene so every gene that makes rna and protein has uh, has to be controlled is commanded and this command essentially what happens is this particular uh, regulatory region um, will respond it will respond for example if there is stress this regulatory region will tell the cell that well there is stress and i am not going to express because that's not my duty some other regulatory gene will respond to that stress when we are aging for example there are yet other promoters or regulatory region that will respond to our aging if we have a disease state of body in our cells that are disease for example cancers the cell cycle regulatory genes will tell look i am cancerous so i have to keep replicating and it will keep giving this replication command and so scientists have very well elucidated particularly in several processes what are the regulatory genes and what are the genes that are not regulatory or which have to obey the command that the regulatory genes are giving them so this is the overall structure of the dna and its structure now going forward we will try to understand how biologists and application scientists have put all, all these pieces together all this information right from the process to the dogma right from the regulatory genes to the genes which express protein they have pieced everything together in a very nice story and we have actually we are now into the era of recombinant dna technology and we are growing now let us look at those molecules let us look at the, the molecules and the processes the process is what i told you earlier the biology dogma the biology dogma says that dna can replicate itself that means dna can make its own copy from the time we were in our mother's womb till today our dna is replicating that means we are growing till our adulthood even there is a wounding there is repair there is damage there is continuous repair and because of this the dna also has to replicate so you need what is known as a polymerase for this replication this is one of the first steps in in our biological processes involving dna as i said the dna has to make rna and the rna has to make protein and the protein is the one that will go to various points of our cell it will go to the membrane the mitochondria the various parts of our cell i'm not going to the details but this is what i would like to impress upon you that this process is known as the molecular biology dogma let's now look at the molecules a bit closely there is a modification system that was discovered in all bacteria and when this was discovered way back in the you know early 60s people found out that there are crucial enzymes that help bacteria to fight phages or viruses they are known as restriction enzymes so what are restriction enzymes so restriction enzymes basically are known as the scissors or cutters of dna essentially what they do is they will cut dna that means they will um, so basically they have catalytic activity they can essentially hydrolyze the phosphodiester bond i spoke about the phosphodiester bond which joins one nucleotide with the other so every restriction enzyme has this job 
people found out with time that restriction enzymes come in two flavors. One restriction enzyme which will produce such sticky ends, which will produce what is known as a staggered end. So the way it will go is if you can trace my, my cursor, it will go like this and it will cut this way through and then this way. So it will produce staggered ends. On the other hand, there is another type of restriction enzyme that will cut through and through. Like how a scissor literally cuts through and through, like a knife cutting both the strands. And that will give what is known as the blunt end. So with this discovery, people realize that DNA can be cut. Now the question is, if I've cut my DNA, can I stitch it back? Can I glue it back? Can I, you know, uh, uh, bring some sticker or some glue and bring it back? That is when people discovered an enzyme known as ligase. And they found out that these cut ends, both these strands can be brought back by the use of the DNA ligase, giving rise to our parental strand, which was cut. So these two molecules played a very important role uh, and they, they basically became the starters to recombinant DNA technology. On the other hand, I mentioned about DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase, as I said, is involved in replication and make several copies of itself. So if I had this parental DNA strand and I plug in DNA polymerase over here, DNA polymerase along with some helper proteins, DNA polymerase can very elegantly make several, several copies and the process can actually continue. I'll show you where the biological process of DNA replication is replicated in a test tube by, by a process known as polymerase chain reaction a little later uh, uh, in, my, in, my in my talk. So these were the crucial molecules that were discovered at this time. Then came a time in the 1970s, particularly at Stanford University, wherein there was a lab, uh, Paul Berg's lab, his student, Janet Mertz, she wanted to try various combinations. So she had this, you know, funky idea where she thought, if I have these scissors, let me cut these scissors, let me take viral DNA, and let me cut these scissors in some, you know, uh, let me cut this DNA with randomness. And let me see whether I can stitch them, that back. Parallelly, there were two scientists, um, uh, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bayer, where uh, Dr. Boyer, where they both both were parallelly studying at Stanford to to you know see whether we can make something artificial uh, like a E. coli DNA or something artificial like a viral DNA. Okay. Both these labs collaborated and they found out that you can actually take these various fragments and that is what Janet did. She took these various fragments, she created all these fragments on her own by using these restriction enzymes and she joined them into pieces and then you got a new DNA, artificial DNA. You took just, uh, you know, some original DNA, you put some pieces of DNA and you can bring another DNA. This was termed as recombinant DNA. And that's the beginning of recombinant DNA technology. The credit for this recombination, uh, recombinant DNA technology goes to Cohen and Boyer, which, who actually got the Nobel Prize. And then came a huge era where restriction enzymes were discovered one after the other from various bacteria. We knew just one or two in the 1970s. Then there was a uh, you know, restriction enzyme uh, database in 1974. Then there were 100 REs and now we have more than 1,000 REs at our disposal. They are all available in the market. Um, you can actually buy them uh, very easily for not a very expensive uh, price. And you can use this specifically. The only thing that you should remember is all these restriction enzymes have their specific cutting sites. I cannot use one restriction enzyme and cut a site that has been that is available for another restriction enzyme. So there is specificity in restriction enzymes. But now we have more, I mean, over 1,000 restriction enzymes and we can make such combinations by cutting whichever restriction enzyme we have, we can just cut, make several fragments and keep joining them. And therefore, now you can see the market. The market has really grown for all these enzymes, whether it is a restriction enzyme or a ligase or, or a polymerase, etc. It has really grown and it is anticipated that it's really going to double in another uh, seven to eight years. And that is the impact that has created. Now, with this restriction enzyme, as I told you, Cohen and Boyer, who received the Nobel Prize, um, who started their work in 1952 and 53, they were basically trying to see whether we can create some artificial DNA. 
that is when they uh, stumbled upon one particular molecule. This molecule is known as plasmid. Let me just give you a couple of lines on plasmid. So what is plasmid? Plasmid is basically an extra chromosomal DNA element present in several bacteria. E. coli, for example, you know, the, 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 the one that I mentioned earlier also, E. coli basically has several plasmids in them. There is an advantage of these plasmids. You know, plasmids can make a particular bacteria resistant to antibiotics. Plasmid can give special um, traits to bacteria. Like, you know, it, it can grow on certain media, whereas its wild type counterpart or any other counterpart bacteria cannot grow on those media. This is also known as oxytocin. But I'm not getting into the details. Suffice it to say that Cohen and Boyer, they took viral DNA, they took plasmid DNAs, and they created their own artificial plasmid by doing the mixing and matching experiment that was uh, very daringly taken up by Janet. And they arrived upon this artificial plasmid, which was known as PSC101 plasmid. 101 is just the number given by Cohen. SC stands for, uh, for, for his name, basically Stanley Cohen. And it was this, this discovery. Now, all the enzymes and the plasmid, both these discoveries created a big uh, uh, uproar in the biological community. It, was, it almost seemed like you know, an impossible task. How can you just cut pieces of DNA and just glue them and make artificial DNA? It can be dangerous. It can be pathogenic. However, with time, uh, people... So with time, people realize that all plasmids are not dangerous. There can be multiple plasmids and they can actually be used to our favor, to for, for the sake of humanity. So a typical plasmid, therefore, was designed in several labs. Now, a typical plasmid is nothing but, again, a double-stranded DNA. It should have an origin of replication so that it can divide in the cell in which you're going to transfer this plasmid. It can be selected because it has a gene for antibiotic resistance. It could also have another selectable marker. Only one selectable marker will do. Now, the speciality of this plasmid is that you can insert any gene of your interest at a suitable site and any gene of your interest when i say i mean i mean that it could be a, a dna from a human uh, dna it could be from a plant it could be from another bacteria it could be from any life source whichever has dna and suitably you can insert this dna in this uh, entire plasmid so with this there came a huge uh, addition of plasmids. Various types of natural plasmids were isolated from bacteria. Various types of uh, artificial plasmids were made. And of course, the count is going up. I myself in my lab, maybe having uh, hundreds or you know maybe two, two, three hundreds of plasmids already made artificially by picking up human genes and putting them in a plasmid, which may be of bacterial origin. And uh, therefore, with this, I would then like to tell you that now we have all the resources. There came a time when all the resources became available. Enzymes were available. Plasmids were available. Plasmids could be created the way you want. Basically, we could play God. And we could take these plasmids and push them into any cell. It could be a bacterial cell. It could be an algal cell. It could be a fungal cell, a human cell, an animal cell, a plant cell, a crop cell, anything. And it, it was almost like a dream come true that look, there is a plasmid, there is a DNA that is coming from some bacterial source and you can put it in humans. This was a hypothesis that was floated. So people thought if we can do this kind of jingoism, you can essentially postpone ripening of fruits, you can increase the productivity in plants, you can create stress-resistant plants, you can create uh, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, you can demand your, uh, your host cell. So wherever the plasmid goes and it is pushed in, that's called the host cell. The host cell can be demanded to produce your protein of choice. You could introduce a good gene. Good gene, I mean, you know, uh, something that is uh, normal, okay, not abnormal, not, not mutagenic or diseased. You could also replace a diseased gene or a bad gene. This was the hypothesis that was floated sometimes in the 1980. Nevertheless, if you can... Think for a while, you will realize that this process is not so easily done. That is because 
this source, this plasmid is from a foreign source for any other animal cell or a bacterial cell or an algal cell. Therefore, pushing it or forcing it into any one of these host cells would not have been so easy. Besides, if I wanted a target protein or if I wanted an inserted gene or a target gene, if that gene is not very abundant in the human cell or in the target uh, DNA that you are trying to insert in this plasmid, there could be problems. Therefore, this particular procedure happened to be very slow. It took a decade or so for us to you know, make these various artificial plasmids and try to devise techniques and optimize tools to push them into these host cells. Until the late 80s and the early 90s came one more very, very important tool that was introduced by Carrie Mullis, who actually got a Nobel Prize in 1993. This is the process that I was talking about earlier, which is akin to the biological process of DNA replication. So what are the components that are required for this particular reaction? This reaction is known as a polymerase chain reaction. It involves the following components which we also call as the PCR component. You can pick up any DNA sample that you want to amplify. So basically the process is going to amplify your gene or make your gene abundant in a test tube, not in a cell, in a test tube. So you can take your DNA from any source. Let's take a human source. Then you need what is known as a driver. It's same like a, you know, like a car. You, you have the car you have the passengers or you have the people sitting in the car or, or it could be a bus, the passengers are sitting or a train, the passengers are sitting, but there's no driver to start the machine, right? So when I want to amplify this DNA sample, I need a driver and primers are the driver. Primers are the one that will kickstart the engine to start so that this polymerase can sit on this DNA and start its polymerization for which you need raw material like fuel. If you need uh, to start the car, you need the fuel. So these are the raw materials and the nucleotides that I mentioned. And therefore, if you have a DNA sample, you have a polymerase that is going to extend the um, DNA. You need the raw material to have this polymer and therefore the ATGC nucleotides have to be abundant in the cell. And then you need an appropriate buffer because all these uh, reactions happen uh, close to neutrality, around 7.4 or so. And you dump them in a PCR tube. And you put them in a machine, which is known as a thermal cycler. So what does a thermal cycler do? Let's, let's try to understand what the thermal cycler will do. As I said, again, we have the double-stranded DNA. So it, it could be our gene of interest. Maybe let's say this gene is going to make, a, uh, make my... Um, Let's say I'm the color of my eye will be blue. Let's say it's the gene that makes the color of my eye blue. I have specific primers or the drivers. I have the polymerase and I have all the nucleotides that are you know mixed in all this. You put it in a thermal cycler. The thermal cycler's temperature is raised in such a way now that this double-stranded DNA separates into two single strands. When it separates into two single strands and you drop the temperature, the polymerase and the primer is going to specifically bind to the gene of interest because the primers are designed to be very specific to the target of interest, to the DNA sequence of our interest. And once you do this, you again uh, increase the temperature slightly, after which this polymerase will then start synthesizing your gene. And when it starts synthesizing your gene, basically it's an extension protocol where DNA polymerase, you will use the raw material in the test tube and start making one more round of the opposite strand. Therefore, this is called the template strand and this is called the new strand that is polymerized by the polymerase. So in the first cycle, you the double-stranded DNA has become, one double-stranded DNA has become two double-stranded DNA. Now, if I repeat the cycle, two double-stranded DNAs will become four double-stranded DNAs and so on and so forth. So with every cycle, there will be an exponential rise in the DNA of uh, the starting material. Whatever target material you started with, it is going to increase several, several copies. So if you are going to have N cycles, you will have two raised to N number of copies. And now imagine you started with a single copy of your DNA of interest. Now you've landed up with so many DNAs. And you can do a lot many things with these uh, abundantly formed DNA and that too in a test tube. So 
now that DNA can actually be visualized in a gel, I'm really not going to go through this, but suffice it to say that you can actually view these by separating on a gel gelatin-based uh, matrix, which is a very stable matrix because DNA is negatively stranded. It will move from the negative to the positive and you can actually separate your DNA of interest and you can actually get it out of the gel and use it for various other purposes. So this particular technique of uh, polymerase chain reaction has contributed immensely to the biological world, has contributed to diagno for diagnostic purposes in the health industry, uh, in research, in detecting a particular disease. So if I have a blood sample or, or have any other sample you know, from, the, from a diseased person, say a thro throat swab or a urine sample, or, or any other samples, any other body fluid, even including saliva, you can basically use very specific primers and create a toolkit in which you can detect the diseases that are there in these fluid samples. The same thing is true with water samples. You can actually go around picking up water and judge the quality by just finding out what are the organisms that are present simply by doing a PCR. And of course, it has contributed a lot to basic research and industrial research equally. I'll now show you the one that has created an uproar in the recent past for COVID. The similar technique, and almost similar, it's called RT-PCR, but it's a PCR-based technique, was used to show that, you know, this is a very, very fruitful, important, and significant uh, technique that quickly was resolved by people in the diagnostic fields with the help from uh, basic scientists who actually coined several modifications of PCR. One of these was used for COVID. So in COVID, I'll save you through this. You collect the sample, you disperse it in a particular buffer, and you extract RNA. Because coronavirus is an RNA-based viruses, you might want to know that viruses come in two flavors. RNA viruses and DNA viruses. Coronavirus was an RNA virus and you cannot do uh, PCR with an RNA sample because the RNA will get de degraded in your thermal cycle. It is very unstable. DNA on the other hand does not. And therefore what you can do is you can convert this RNA into cDNA or DNA by using another enzyme which I haven't mentioned. It's called, it's called as reverse transcriptase and put it through the uh, thermal cycler and the thermal cycler will then depending on uh, whether the virus is present in the sample or not even if it is uh, one virus it can basically be converted into DNA and then into a poly using a polymerase chain reaction it can convert several several uh, copies of the uh, viral DNA and if it is beyond a particular threshold you, you count this particular sample as either positive or negative. If it is above the threshold, it is positive, saying that your virus was present in this human sample. And if it is below the threshold, um, you, you would say that either the virus is not present or it is present in much less alarming uh, quantities. So basically, you can also calculate what is known as a viral load in a given sample. That is where... Uh, the entire controversy as to what is the threshold came about and there was some discussion going on and we therefore there were a lot of iterations of uh, you know this COVID testing and uh, these landed uh, landed us with you know um, false negatives and false positive. Once we actually overcame this problem using specific primers the problem of false negatives and false uh, positives were also taken care of. So this is the this is the market trend of PCR and real time PCR, uh, you know, uh, currently uh, given in US uh, dollars, almost 21 billion so far, and particularly this has gone up during COVID. It is expected to really boost in the next four years because we've learned a lot from COVID, and we've also learned that this can be an immediate diagnostic tool for something that is unknown for a pathogen, may it be a virus, a fungus or anything for that matter. It can actually serve as a diagnostic tool uh, for any such diseases. So therefore, these are the various applications that have been tried thus far using all the um, enzymes, proteins, and PCR, including plasmids. And uh, this, this, I'm not going to go through each of them. Uh, suffice it to say that with this came another revolution what we call, call as cloning, or what we also call as genetic engineering. So what is cloning? Cloning is essentially using a plasmid and 
harnessing or isolating a particular target DNA into the plasmid. When you are isolating that particular DNA, say from a hu human, and you are putting it into a plasmid, you are essentially mobilizing your gene of interest into a plasmid. This particular procedure is known as cloning, cloning of genes. And cloning of genes has really, really come a long way. And cloning of genes has therefore given rise to several types of plasmids. What does this mean? So I spoke about plasmid and I also said that plasmids can be transferred from one organism to another, from a bacteria to a plant, from a bacteria to a human, from a human to a bacteria and so on. So, so you can go crisscross, you can really match all these in various combinations. All this research has culminated into the formation of these various types of plasmids, such that depending on the demand, depending on what you want, whether you want a protein or you want to trace a particular molecule inside a cell or you want to find out what kind of virus is present, what, is the, what are the sequences on the viruses, what are the genes on the viruses, and also you can knock off a gene. You can actually remove a particular gene, a diseased gene from your body. So such plasmids have now been floating in the market and all the combinations, as I said, are available. And I will give you an example of each of these and I'll show you how these plasmids have helped in gene therapy, how these plasmids have helped in transgenics as well as in medicine and health. So... Let me give you one example out here. So, um, so here what has happened is um, you have your gene of interest and the gene of interest has been mobilized into your plasmid. Okay, the gene of interest, as I said, could be anything. It could be uh, maybe a gene that makes insulin. It could be a gene that makes uh, a very important enzyme. It could be a gene uh, that can actually um, unblock your arteries, you know, anything. You have to just know what gene it has you want to transfer, okay? And all these genes have now been identified because they're very well annotated on the human genome. So, you can actually make several, several copies using PCR and by transferring the plasmid into your bacterial cell, you can keep multiplying this bacteria on a suitable medium, which is very cheaply available, and you can keep isolating the gene. By isolating the gene, you have essentially made several, several copies of your gene and you can transfer this gene to a crop, as I said. You can also transfer this gene to bacteria which are harmless, but which can actually clean your water, pollution, toxic material, you can produce artificial bacteria. You can make bacteria do what you want. You can ask the bacteria, there is ammonia in this water. Please make an enzyme that will degrade the ammonia. There is uh, some uh, fertilizer that, or, or a pesticide that is very toxic that has been thrown in this effluent. Let us make a bacteria that can actually degrade that particular pesticide. So using this gene, we can, I mean, these are just the two that I have shown you. You can also use the protein. You can isolate the protein. You can purify the protein. You can inject the protein into, for example, uh, you know, directly into a system, in a human system, which can go and dissolve a blood clot. It can also be a growth hormone, which is proteinic in nature. The growth hormone can be used to stimulate growth, can actually increase the height of certain stunted people. So these are some of the uses that I've shown, uh, which allows us to combine the various enzymes that I've mentioned, the plasmids as well as the host, and um, lead us to what is known as a copy, cut, and a paste phenomenon. So you can copy your gene, you can cut your gene, you can paste your gene, and then you can transfer them to suitable host. This is one such uh, plant-specific plasmid you can grow it in bacteria, you can make tons of the uh, gene of interest and the gene of interest can be then transferred to a bacteria, sorry, to a plant cell and the plant cells can then be grown in a field. And this plant cell can be resistant to stress, it can be tolerant to desiccation or drought, it can be tolerant to a particular bug or a pest, 
and you can do many many things you can increase the age of the plant you can introduce fruiting in the plant provided we know that the gene that you are handling is of the correct uh, 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 correct frame that means when you are introducing it into a particular cell it has to do the job that it is supposed to you can't just take a random gene and do this work it is not only going to be an expensive affair but it is not going to be a fruitful affair at all so with this we have come about with a new era in uh, in genetically modified uh, uh, fruits or genetically modified plants where we have what is known as a genetically modified golden rice which has been modified with the daffodil genes to have more of beta carotene and beta carotene is very useful because it you know our body can actually convert it to vitamin a which is uh, very useful for our body and this is the difference that you see in the gmo and the normal so the, the color comes from the beta carotene then you have the flower sour tomatoes which under normal conditions ripen faster or and they become very soft soon whereas the gmos are quite sturdy then of course you must have heard a lot of noise on the bt cotton which uh when applied when used in a re genetic uh, recombination method can actually introduce certain toxins into the into the plant which can take care of your uh, bacillus bt stands for bacillus thuringiensis which is essentially a pathogen for many crops and then you can also have a salmon with a growth hormone that can regulate the gene and increase the size of the salmon so, so that the body mass goes up and for fun there are some people who have actually um, you know created certain animals whose proteins can actually glow in the dark so you can actually identify your pets in the dark as well now this was as far as the gene part is concerned now i'll also show you that there are certain antibodies that have been created because you know if you want to create antibodies you basically have to go back to the animal and you have to do animal farming and you have to you know feed the animal very well you have to keep getting the blood from the animal and so on and so forth the uh, genetic engineering for antibody has now changed wherein you can just go to the animal once it could be a rabbit it could be a rat it could be a goat it could be any animal from which you want to make the antibody you isolate a particular b cell which is which is which has the ability to produce antibodies you screen those b cells and you select two chains the light and the heavy chain which are essentially two parts of an antibody you mobilize them in your plasmid you uh, clone them produce the antibody by using the expression plasmid and you can purify the antibody and this can be supplied to whomever you want those who require antibody you can even go back to the animal it can be used on humans very safely because iggs are fairly conserved across mammals so this is how you can produce antibody you can also produce insulin and insulin was produced this way so the gene for insulin basically there are two genes for insulin or uh, insulin a and insulin b so the respective genes can be put in the plasmid it's the same philosophy you put the plasmid take the plasmid take the gene plug it in put it in the bacteria isolate the both the insulin insulin a insulin b you mix them and what you get is an active and functional insulin which has now been used for several purposes so now you can so there was a time when first insulin was made it was made from pig subsequent with the pig gene pig insulin gene subsequently it was made from the cow gene and because of several you know there, there are sentimental values associated with these animals people have now switched over to the human gene so you are getting a human insulin you are not getting an insulin from any other animal so therefore the human insulin gene themselves have been genetically engineered and artificially produced by bacteria purified and then uh, you know uh, given into the market so that those can be sold as insulin gene itself so this slide is little paint but here i want to say that this has taken us cloning pcr has taken us to sequencing of genes okay genes have now been sequenced dna has been sequenced entire genomes have been sequenced and the sequence have now been deposited in several databases for the public to view for the public to understand what our genes contain so this is basically sequencing and you using these kind of technologies including sequencing you can pick up any species from the wild you can pick up any species from the zoo 
You can pick up any species from the forest, from anywhere you want, and you and classify them. Classification of organisms has completely changed with, with PCR, with sequencing. You simply have to extract the DNA from these materials. You do a PCR amplification and you sequence them. And you have what is known as a QR code for each of these species. So this, this activity is continuously happening, has been happening over the years now. And we now have a QR code for every species that we, that we you know, uh, come across. Old, old species that we know and also newer species that are being isolated. There was a time when you could not grow these species, particularly bacteria. You couldn't grow all the bacteria. There are so many zillions of bacteria still waiting to be isolated. So you can actually uh, pick up bacteria from the air and you can do what is known as a metagenomics. You can actually pick up these bacteria, uh, go through a DNA extraction, PCR amplify, because you just need one copy of DNA to do PCR amplification. This is a very high throughput amplification and a high throughput sequencing. And then you can annotate the genome and barcode it. And this has been, this exercise is, has also now started for several other higher animals as well. So this is the trend, uh, the number of genomes that have been sequenced over the years, right from 2005 to, till now, this is about 2022. There are more than 350 such genomes that have been sequenced and the costing of sequence has tremendously come down. Currently, we stand at around 200 to $300 per genome, which means, which means that you can essentially now do human genome sequencing. Although human genome sequencing had started way back in the 90s, the Human Genome Project had started, but it was very expensive. Now with the many technologies coming together, high throughput methods being put together, you can actually do genome sequencing of humans. So why do we need to do genome sequencing? Why is there such a hue and cry about genome sequencing? That is because it can help us know what is the disease that we carry, Maybe today we do, we do not show the symptoms and signs of those diseases. Just by doing a genome sequences, you can do what is known as predictive diagnosis. You can actually predict that in future, you might get a disease. A classical case is of Angelina Jolie, who actually came to know that you know, she is carrying the cancer gene, which is known as a BRCA gene. You can therefore do early and accurate diagnosis. You can do effective monitoring of your genes by doing what is known as a therapy selection and and a couple of slides on therapy are, are awaited and I'll share that with you. You can recurrently monitor your, your, your genome. So the way we go through blood checkup every year, the way we go through you know uh, uh, several of these medical checkups on an annual basis, you can do, do genome sequencing on an annual basis because you will know what are the insults your genome is undergoing as and when you are growing, as and when you are aging, as and when you know you feel you are probably vulnerable to a disease because my father had it or my grandfather had it. So all these things are now in place. They are effective and India is already in the race and I'll show you some slides how India is faring. This is the gene therapy I was saying. So basically you can pick up your scalpel and remove the bad portion from your DNA. How do we do it? Assume there is a cell where one of the genes is not functioning and we know about it. By the way, you should be knowing. If there is a disease state, there are symptoms, you know, sequencing can tell you that your uh, cell is not functioning. What you do is you go to another healthy person, you take the healthy gene, you amplify the gene and you push that gene into your patient sample. And lo and behold, you can actually correct this gene and the cell can now function properly. And this is how you this is how you can also do it with viruses, viruses which are not pathogenic, which are altered to be non-pathogenic. You can actually put it in the virus and then you can inject the virus into your stream. And once it is in, in, injected into your stream, you can go and target the cells that are bad, convert the bad genes to good genes. And as I said, lo and behold, you get a good and a healthy body back. This is another way of showing it. So as I said, India has already launched it way back in 2019. DBT had already done this with 22 partners. It has already started. 
10,000 numbers uh, of gene yeah, genomes were collected. 7,000 have already been done. 3,000 genomes are being uh, sequenced and collated. And then there are some players in the field in India who are now offering you what is known as Janam Patri to Genome Patri so that you unlock the DNA secrets that are there in your, uh, in your body, in your cells. And so... This, as I said, there are many players in the field. I have only picked up a few, but the major players in the field are Strand Life Sciences, Map My Genome, Med Genome, and of late, Reliance also has got into this. Mukesh Ambani has already uh, taken up this, uh, you know, as a foray and a responsibility where he says that he is going to charge not more than $145 per genome. And this is definitely much cheaper than what, uh, you know, what other people are offering, so that you can, you know, now have a chip. You can have a barcode for your own genome and then you can just keep it in your files or you can keep it on your computers and then next time when you're going, you can tell, this was my genome and uh, look, I want to now check my genome after two years, after three years. Have I undergone any kind of insult? Please show me, am I vulnerable to any other disease? So this is what is currently the trend in the market and also in India, and it is catching on quite rapidly. Therefore, this is now, you know, mushrooming everywhere uh, in, in terms of what we call as biotechnology. It has touched all areas of biotechnology, industry, agriculture, research, environment, food, medicine, and so on and so forth. This is how the global genomics market is looking. It's really booming, and we expect uh, almost a 13% rise in the next few years. Last but not the least, I would like to leave you with what is in my mind. After knowing our genome sequence, after knowing several human genome sequences, they are all deposited in the public database. Okay, you can actually access. Of course, if you want to do it privately, you can keep it private. You know, you need not share your genome sequence with everybody. Knowing that now there is a human genome where we know what is a gene that codes for a blue eye, what is a gene that codes for good muscles, what is a gene that will not give you cancer? What is a gene that will not give you this rare disease? And so on and so forth. That is The list is huge. When people started collating this and they realized that this is that there could be an astounding effect and there could therefore be also a wrong effect, okay, unethical effect. That is where people are now demanding that I want, say for example, I mean I'm just giving you some loose examples. I want the color of Aishwarya Rai. I want uh, the bodily strength of Hrithik Roshan and the height of Amitabh Bachchan and so on and so forth. Can we really create a designer being? Can we have a designer human being? Can we have a gene introduced in our bodies, say at the age of 45 or 50, where it will tell me that, look, now you live for another 45 and 50 years or maybe even 100 years. So people are now looking at longevity genes, genes that will increase your lifespan. It's just a matter of putting it in your body and increasing your lifespan. And this has given rise to one interesting personality. We call we, we know him as John Craig Venter. He is now, so essentially he was a part of the Human Genome Project when it started. And then he decoupled, once the project stopped, he decoupled because somebody took over for the annotation and he started his own institute, which is known as the Craig Venter Institute. He is interested in knowing what are the genes that lead us to death. And I'm not talking about programmed cell death. I'm talking about organismal death. Why do we die? Are there genes for death? He is trying to find out and decode death. So now the question is, is he playing God? And with this, he essentially is trying to say that human genome science has a long way to go and... I I would say that, you know, um, very soon we might actually start introducing, instead of taking pills, we'll just probably inject some gene into, into our system and uh, become healthy and live long. And uh, that's all for now. Thank you for your attention. I hope I have wound up on time. Oh, very captivating talk, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, we have already messages pouring in the chat. Um, okay. Anybody has questions? And uh, if 
Dr. Sheila would like to like to take a few questions from the audience. Yeah, what are your views your on the, there is Seema Das on what are your views on reverse aging? That's one question that's come up. So, so I mean, um, that that's what I said. You know, the the gene for longevity is already on. We have found out four, four crucial genes. Uh, the genes have been termed as sirtuins, S I R T U I N. And these have been found from nematodes. They have also been found in the human system. They seem to be playing some role. There's, so uh, when we talk of a biological process, you may want to know that it is not a very simple process. It's a very complicated process. Even the tiny measly E. coli has a complicated cell. And it's a crisscross of several biological processes. So when you talk of uh, age, okay, it it is not just one independent biological process. There are many other processes that pour into it. There are many other processes that withdraw from it. So diet apparently seems to be playing a, a very important role in longevity. However, it has also been proven that um, various other factors along with these genes play a very vital role. So just by plugging in, the, as I said, it's, it's not very simple. It, it really seems to be a dream come true but I'm quite sure that once we understand the entire process of longevity I mean there won't be a long time when we would be injecting the genes in our body and controlling our diets and live long. I hope it has answered your question. Uh, 